Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the First Baptist Church Rotmart. We are excited uh, that each and every one of you are here uh, this morning. Uh, just have a few announcements for us uh, as we uh, go forward this morning. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that VBS, VBS is on the horizon. And I'd like to encourage uh, each and every one of you uh, to get plugged in. If you need to get plugged in, if you, if you need to get your name signed up, uh, come see me, come see Sandy, come see Amanda, and uh, we would look forward to giving you a ministry opportunity uh, towards kids that week. Uh, also, a very important meeting today uh, after church uh, concerning uh, the, the camp. And so I would encourage uh, each teen uh, parent uh, to be in attendance uh, for that. And so uh, thank you. If you would, at this time, please stand and greet one another. Thank you, thank you. Would you, would you remain standing as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? And what a wonderful day it is. What a wonderful thing it is to be together in God's house with God's people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your presence. We are joyous because the joy you give. There is none like unto thee, O Lord. There is none who cares for us like you do. Oh, Lord, we pray this morning, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Please remain standing as we sing hymn number 104, O Worship the King. We'll sing all five verses, number 104, O Worship the King. Please remain standing. <clears throat> Try 
us nor find thee to fail. Thy memories, how tender, how firm to the end. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. All hail to the King in splendor. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I think uh, most of you know that uh, Joyce and I are very active in the Gideons, not only in our camp here, but in the state as well. But uh, one of the things that we do as Gideons, uh, many times, uh, we speak in each other's churches. And uh, I've gotten to know uh, the speaker that's coming today very well. He's... Uh, one of my favorite people. So I hope everybody uh, uh, will uh, open their, uh, their uh, hearts and their ears and listen to what Richard has to say uh, to all of us today. Richard Grimes, thank you very much. On a cold day, men were passing out scriptures in a small Siberian town. And after handing out their last scripture, a woman come up to them and asked for a Bible. Well, the men explained they only had their English language Bible with them. Well, she then asked something that we don't hear much in the United States. She asked if she could just look at a Bible. Well, when the men gave her their Bible in a language she didn't even understand, she fell to her knees and thanked God for letting her just look at and touch God's Word. She went on to explain that she was a Christian, but she had never seen a Bible. God's Word is so powerful in any tongue. Well, good morning. As Tim said, I'm representing the Gideons International this morning, and thank you for letting me share with you today about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And thank you, Bill, for giving me 45 minutes to speak this morning, too. I, I appreciate that. So, <clears throat> the only thing that will stop a Baptist from speaking is somebody saying we're having banana pudding after the service, in which case we'll all go home. <clears throat> but Isaiah 55, 11 says this, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. This verse gives us Gideons the hope, the joy, and the assurance of knowing that the time spent placing God's word in personal witnessing is well worth the investment. Now some of you might ask, who are these Gideon guys anyway? Well, without going through a lot of history, let me give you the short version. We are you. Well, let me explain. We're Christian uh, businessmen and professional men, and our job is to, produce, to bring others to Christ by placing Bibles and personal witnessing. We're not preachers. We're not pastors. It's pretty debatable whether we're public speakers or not. But we are thousands strong and we're placing Bibles in uh, about 200 countries around the world. So does any of y'all here remember the little red Bibles that were given out to fifth graders? Some of y'all do? Okay. Now, I'm sure all of you here today own your own Bibles, and your children do also. But can you imagine getting a Bible for the very first time? Can you imagine carrying this home to your parents who may have never seen a Bible before? More importantly, can you imagine someone in that family opening up God's word and finding Jesus? And that's what it's all about. Now, 
I've had the privilege of distributing Bibles to fifth graders, and, it, and it's a whole lot of fun. And a lot of them, yeah, a lot of them already have Bibles, but a lot don't. So is it worth it? We think so. We think so to get that out there. Let me tell you, uh, share with you a little about a little girl named Amber that lived in Arkansas. Now, Amber was in the fifth grade, last day of school. Gentlemen uh, passed out the New Testaments to them. So she got her Bible, you know, no big deal. She went up and asked the teacher for a box. Well, the teacher gave her a box, still no big deal. But she started watching Amber. And what Amber was doing, she got her Bible, she got the box, and she was putting tissue around it. And she was sitting there and putting it in the box, just, just like you would pack something if you were shipping something precious across the world. So she was putting it in there, and the teacher said, Amber, what are you doing? She said, well, she said, you know I ride the bus home? She said, and I want to make sure this Bible gets home safely. She said, because my parents won't go to church, and they've already said they won't buy me a Bible, and I want to make sure I get this Bible home safely to my house. Which just makes you wonder, how many Ambers live right around here? It just makes you wonder, is it worth it? And we think it is. We think it is. Well, there's a gentleman that went to a, um, went to a doctor's office, and I figured he was bored out of his brain. And so he went to the doctor's office. He must have read every popular science, every popular mechanics that I'd read, you know, whatever. And he finally, he just got bored out of his brain, and he picked up a Bible. You figured he had to be pretty bored, right? I mean, that's what he did. He just got bored. So he picked up one of those. He started reading it. God's Word in God's book convicted that man while he was in the doctor's office. He accepted Jesus. And he went on to write in when he wrote into us and said, until that second that he accepted Jesus, he was president of his local atheist society. Is it worth it? We think so. We think so. Now, probably about now, some of y'all are wondering, you know, where would your money go to and, and what's it used for? And that is an excellent question. That's what I'm here for today, to tell you where your previous gifts have gone and to ask for your support again. Not just every dime, but every penny that a church or individual gives goes to purchasing scriptures. Now everybody goes, yeah, but what about, you know, all this other stuff, you know? And we've all seen that. And just to tell you, our dues cover that. And if I can't pay them, Tim does. So, hey, you know, so we're all covered on that. So, but, but we cover our own expenses, everything else. So we just want you to know that every cent that a church gives goes to purchasing scriptures. And that goes to placing Bibles in somebody's hand. And that's what we're all about. Now, as I mentioned before, we're an extension of your church. Now, we're placing Bibles some places where it's hard for local churches to do, like prisons, schools, doctor's offices, nurses' homes, uh, military, places like that where lots of times it's hard for local churches or even individuals to get into. We're allowed to go in and distribute Bibles. Uh, We're in around... 200 countries around the world today, and we've placed over 2.3 billion scriptures around the world. So we get to do all that stuff, but what we need, and everybody thinks, okay, he's going to be asking for money. Well, of course I am. But the other thing is, what do we need more than money? Anybody know? Prayer. Prayer. Prayer for doors to be open for doors to stay open. One of the strangest things is in the United States, it's the hardest place to distribute Bibles almost. Other countries are asking for them. The United States says, no, 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 it can't be in. So for doors to be open so we can give Bibles here in the United States more also. So these little Bibles like this, these are like about a buck 28. These are, the hotel Bibles are about $5. So gifts of a dollar. Gifts are 50 cents. Whatever you can give goes a long ways at getting a Bible in somebody's hand. Now, one of those hands and lives was a young man named Mark. Now, when Mark was in high school, 
And Mark was extremely anti-religious. Matter of fact, Mark even studied books on how to discredit his crazy Christian friends. But he decided, you know what, if you re he decided when he was in the hotel, now this is not audience participation time, nobody raise your hand. Mark decided he was going to steal something. So he decided in the hotel when they stayed overnight on a trip, he would steal, well, he wasn't going to steal the towels, because if y'all have a Holiday Inn towel collection at home, that's wrong. <laughs> Just don't do that. So, but he decided, you know what he's going to do? <clears throat> he's going to steal a Bible because it would make somebody like Tim and I, it'd make somebody mad. That was his purpose. Well, what he don't, what Mark didn't understand was we affectionately call that the alternative Bible distribution plan. So <laughs> it kind of goes out, and that's fine. We're good with that, you know. We'll put another one in there, and it'll find another home. We're good with it. So, but he decided he'd steal a Bible. But Mark decided, you know, if you're really going to argue with your friends, you need to read their book. That way you can just really have some good arguments. Well, again, God's Word and God's book convicted Mark's heart while he was reading it for an entirely different reason. And it was that alternatively distributed Bible that started Mark on the road to Jesus. And again, we say, is it worth it? We think so. We think so. Tim, do y'all have a Bible distribution rack here? Okay, anybody know where it's at? This is alternate. This is, anybody know where it's at? And nobody but Tim knows where that thing is? Okay, look, y'all. This thing is fun. Okay, most of the time y'all think these things are for funeral homes, right? Okay, that's kind of morbid. No, 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 no. Who's the most happiest people in the world? Christians, right? We want everybody to say, hey, man, I want something that you got. You know, let's, let's have fun. So I was sitting in a meeting. I'm just going to do this one real quick. Sitting in a meeting with one of our ex-state vice presidents over in Alabama. Um, and Steve asked me, he's punched me, and he said, Richard. I said, you see that man over there? And I said, yeah. He said, what do you think about his hair? Well, I didn't know where this was going. And I said, Tim, I don't think, I'm not Tim, I said, Steve. I said, I don't think he's had hair as long as I've been walking this earth. I said, I don't know if he's ever had hair. He said, I don't think he has either. He said, but I sent five Bibles in memory of his hair the other day and sent him a card. So see, you can have fun with this type stuff, you know? I mean, just have fun. Just don't get hit in the head by the neck. Be careful who you're sending it to. But, but, you know, you can have fun with it. And it don't matter if you do it wrong. My dad sent five Bibles in memory of me one day. And I told him, I said, Dad, I said, you know I'm alive, don't you? And he said, yeah. He said, I hope it don't make a difference. And I said, well, that's two of us that hope it doesn't make a difference because it was getting kind of serious there. So, <clears throat> so you can have fun with that. But the point being is, is to get Bibles in people's hands. Pastors can preach. Teachers can teach. But sometimes in a small, lonely hotel rooms and things like that, there's nobody there but them and the Word of God. And that's where some people meet Jesus. And that's what, we, that's what we're all about, is getting people to meet Jesus. So the best words in any speech, anybody know what the two best words in any speech is? That's close. In closing was the other one, right. That was, that's the one I was going to go with. It sounds better. Okay. But in closing, I'd like to personally thank you for helping make life stories like these possible whether it's in Siberia, small town in Arkansas, or a small, lonely hotel room, people get to come and meet Jesus and get their name wrote in the book of life by reading his word. And there's thousands of stories that have been made because of that. But the big point is there are thousands of more names waiting to be wrote in the book of life for meeting God. So thank y'all very much. Y'all a nice crowd. Y'all a nice bunch. Did I time it right or not? Or are you watching? Okay, good. All right. She was my official timer. If I went over, blame it on her. Right, okay. All right. Thank y'all very much. And for, thank y'all for supporting the Gideons. If you would please stand and sing uh, hymn number 56, To God Be the Glory, number 56. Please stand as we sing all three verses. Number 56.
glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher greater will be our wonder our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And give him the glory, great things he hath done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father. Through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Let's bow our head in prayers, please. Our Father in heaven, Holy Jesus Christ, you give us so much, and we're so blessed, but one thing that you give us that we don't realize most of the time is so many ways that we can worship you. We have so many avenues to take, just like with the Gideons here today, Tim, Sunday school teachers, the choir, we have so many different ways that we can Praise you because you are our holy, holy Father. Right now, we're going to try to give back a little bit to our offering. And that's another way that we have humbly to worship you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, choir, and thank you, Richard. Glad to have you here with us today. Uh, the Gideons have always been some people I respect very much. Nineteen years I served as a military chaplain, gave out a lot of Gideon Bibles because the Gideons couldn't go where I was, but they let me take the Bibles and give them out. Must have given out hundreds of them. 
I can remember out in the Mojave Desert, someone coming to me, Chaplain, do you have one of those little Bibles? I'm stuck here in this foxhole and I don't have anything to do. I said, well, sure, here, take this and take mine, you know, take this one. So I really believe in the work of the Gideons. I've seen it pay off. I've actually been able to take those, there are special ones they make for the soldiers. They have the plan of salvation in the bag. And they also have hymns back there. So if we want to sing hymns, we could look back there and get the words. Now, whether we got the tune or not, I don't know, but the words were there. And I can remember leading people to Christ with that little Gideon Bible, signing my name in the back of it the day they were saved and giving it to them to take with them. I'm telling you, I really think a lot of the Gideons and what they do. And Richard, we appreciate you coming today. Well, I don't know where... Pastor Jason is right now exactly, but I know he's over, we're over in Turkey, and we've been praying for him, and I know he's having a great time there, and, and thank you, church, for giving him this opportunity, because it really means a lot to a pastor to be able to go and study and do things like he's doing today. I also appreciate the privilege to be able to stand here in this pulpit, not in his place, but just to preach, because I can't take his place, but just to take, because this is a church that Lavinia and I have grown to love and appreciate. We're not just members here. We're part of a family, and we all love the Lord. And that's what we have to continue to remember. We'll look in God's Word this morning. We find over in Matthew's Gospel. Not, I'm not going to pick up where Jason was, <laughs> Pastor Jason was. I can't do that. But anyway, I'd like to turn to a familiar passage is found in Matthew 16, and if you would turn there with me, we'll begin reading with verse 13. That's Matthew 16, verse 13. Now, I'll be reading out of the New King James and not the ESV. Why? Because this is large print, and I don't have the ESV in large print. <laughs> so y'all give me, a, please let me do this, all right? When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I the Son of Man am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say unto you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Interesting that Peter is often spoken of by being a foundation of the church, but he's not. His profession of faith, and he's one of the early found, uh, apostles of the foundation, that's true, but Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. To really settle this debate, all you have to do is turn to First Peter, and he tells you. You know, what does he mean? Well, he tells you. And that's uh, exactly what Peter became, one of the stones, but not the stone. And you find over in uh, chapter 2 of 1 Peter, as we begin reading with verse 4, I'd like to stay in this passage that we preached this morning. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, 
a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Lord, bless your word. May it bring forth fruit this day and will not come back null or void, we know. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know all of us have probably seen the, the picture on TV as uh, Pastor Jason was talking about, about Notre Dame and it burned. The church did not burn, the building did. The word cathedral comes from the word that means uh, cathedra, which means seat. It's the seat of the bishop who's over that diocese in, in Paris. So the building is never the church. The church still exists. And the, you can't burn up the church because the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Neither death nor grave nor hell can prevail against God's church. Interesting. I was on a mission trip down in Mexico, down in Padilla, Mexico, called Neo Padilla. We were down there, and there was a, there was a church planter down there from Houston. His name was Juan, and he was helping, trying to, we were down there trying to build an orphanage, and he was trying to get his church started, and they had a little house church there, but he kept talking about going to the temple, going to the temple. And there's a temple over in such and such a little community, and there's a temple over in another little community. And I kept thinking, what in the world is he talking about? And then he explained it to me. The building, as the Spanish see it or the Mexicans see it, is called a temple. That's a house of worship. The church is the people. Remember this old thing we used to do as kids? You remember that? And do it right. Grandpa's all be able to do it right. <laughs> anyway, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, and there's the people. That's backwards. Here's the church, here's the building, here's the steeple. We must always remember that God redeemed a people and not a building. Well, I'm, I'm thankful for the buildings we have here. A lot of people sacrifice to build, but we have to quit thinking about the building being the church. When someone says, Go, well, come with me to First Baptist Church, do they think about the people in here or the building? As precious as this building is, and I'm so glad we have it, you are the church. You're the family of God. We are related by blood, precious blood. We are living stones, precious stones, chosen by God. I don't know of any other organization in this world that has that kind of relationship. Do you? I don't. So this is it. The word ecclesia, we translate church, you get the word ecclesiastic from it, or ecclesiastical from it. Ecclesia means a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place and assembly. It means people who are called out. The church is, a, is a, a group of people, assembly of people who've been called out. Now, if you go over in the book of Acts in chapter 19, and we'll not read all of that, but there was some commotion going on in, in Ephesus because of the preaching. The gospel had been going on there several years, and it was really making a difference, and there were people who were giving up their idols and worshiping God. And the silversmiths, one named Demetrius, caused a riot because, you see, their livelihood came from making silver idols of Diana. And so they just said, hey, that's hurting, that's hurting the bottom line. we got to drive these people out. So they took two of the disciples that Paul had sent over there, and they, they took them into the theater. 
And they begin to cry out, Dinah, Dinah, God, you know, the, you know, the greatest episode, so forth. They carried on for about two hours of that. And then the people came running to see what was going on. And there was a, really a commotion going on. Finally, to the clerk of town, the official came out and says, Hey, this is all wrong. This is all wrong. These men have not robbed temples, neither are they blasphemers. If you have any charges, Demetrius, to bring against these people, we have pro councils here. We have court of law. We have procedures. And this is what is said in, verse, in chapter 19. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. The word assembly there is ecclesia. Ecclesia. So it's called out. In the book of Acts in chapter 7 and verse 38, this is uh, Stephen's defense. Actually, he's just sharing his personal testimony. And he goes through the history in that chapter of Israel and how God called them out of Egypt. Saved them. Called them out of Egypt. Made, him, made them his special people. And gave them prophets and kings and so forth and so on. But he talked about Moses and going up to Mount Sinai. And this is something he said. This is he talking about Moses that was in the church in the wilderness. Now that's King James, but it's assembly. Assembly. You see, church is not a building. It's an assembly of God's people. It's an assembly called out. Notice what it said here in in 1 Peter. You who were once were not a people, but are now the people of God who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Wow. He says, you were called out of darkness, verse 9, into his marvelous light. When we came to Christ, he called us. God is the one who initiates the call. We don't go to God. He comes to us. He awakens a desire in us for us to come to him. And then the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. And then we hear the gospel. And Richard, this is why the word of God is so powerful, so wonderful. Hearing comes by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, but hearing by the word of God. So they need to hear the word of God. But they were called out, out of darkness, out of Egypt, we could say, into his marvelous light or into the promised land that he promised them. So we are, are called out. Now, Jesus told his disciples, come and follow me. We are disciples. And you can't be a disciple of Jesus if you half-heartedly. It has to be, love thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind, thy neighbor as thyself. But you've got to put your whole self into it. Can't be one foot in the kingdom of heaven and one foot out on the other side. It has to be all or nothing. That's what lordship means. We are called out. We are saved. We are followers of Christ. The church is a local assembly of the saved, the followers of Christ. We're called out. We are a congregation. Over in Romans chapter 12, he you know, says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Well, how do you do that? What he goes on to say. In the church, it's like a body. Christ is the head. We are all members. And in that passage of scriptures, everybody is given, he tells about giving a gift. Not everyone has all the gifts, and not, everyone, not even one person has all the gifts, but every person has a gift, and no one is without. Now, what are those gifts supposed to be used for? For the building up of the body of Christ. That whole passage has to do that. Christ is head. We are part of the body. The body cannot function unless it's connected to the head and it follows the head. Now, I've asked Andrew and the choir to do do a demonstration. You no, know, Pastor Jason always has some kind of visual aid. So, I've, so we will have visual aid and we'll use the choir. So Andrew, if you would, uh, let the choir sing, this, sing a song for us. It won't take long.
Now do it right. Okay. <laughs> oh. made the difference. One leader, one sheet of music, and everybody using their gift. We have basses, we have sopranos, we have altos, and tenors, soloists, musicians, a leader, but it doesn't work unless everybody agrees to follow the leader. We are the body of Christ. You have to think about the church being the body of Christ. We belong to each other and we belong to Jesus. I've seen a lot of love in this church. That's one of the reasons we like this church. We like the people where you love each other, where you care for each other. That's important. When that happens, that's a demonstration of the love of God. When the world sees us like sing, doing our own thing, and they see the church doing their own thing. I'm just doing my thing, you know. Confusion happens, and the world can't make any sense out of it. But when you crown him Lord of all, and you s devote yourself to serving him, and then it, the Bible tells us, by love, serve one another. And we use the gift that God has given us, not to brag about what the gift is, just use it. It's no good unless it's used. And, it's, and the thing is, it's, a, it's done by love. And we're supposed to abstain from fleshly lust, but we're to slur, slur each other by love. So the church is a body. It's also the body of Christ. We are to build up that body. People are into body you know, building these days. Well, one of the most important things as members of this church is that we ought to do all we can to build up the body of Christ here. But it's not an exclusive body. It's a body with open arms. Jesus said, come unto me. Come unto me. Uh, I love that cross, but I, I like it because it's empty. We serve a risen Savior. I want to see Jesus with his arms reached out. Come unto me, all ye who are burdened down, heavy laden. Come unto me and I'll give you rest. This is a picture of Jesus that the world needs to see. An amazing thing about it is when, people, when we serve God and, and we put him first in everything that we do, and we're not concerned whether we get recognition. I, you know, I've heard people tell them, I didn't get recognized, and oh, they did something to me and I left the church over there. That is immaturity. I've always loved the people who stay with the stuff and go through difficult times because they love the people they're with and they love God. We need to grow into maturity. And the best, best way we can do that is by studying God's word, preaching God's word, living God's word, and sharing that love with others. So we are part of a body. The church is not a building. It's a body. But not just a body, it's the body of Christ. And Christ is the head. Absolute oh, authority requires absolute obedience. And that's what these Sunday school lessons we've been having in the adult section about loving Christ instead of loving other things. Some difficult things Jesus said. But it meant you've got to put him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and thy soul and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself, and you fulfill all of the law. These are the things that the church is and should be. But I praise God that it's a church. It's not only a church here, local church, 
We have a church spread abroad. Jesus said in, in Matthew, you remember that passage we know so well, as, especially as Southern Baptists in Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So as people go out and share the gospel in local churches are formed. And remember the apostle Paul, he went out and preached in different places and congregations were formed and he wanted to go back and check on those local churches. But we're not just by ourselves in this work. There is the church abroad where the gospel has gone. There's a church in China. There's even a church in Iran. There's a church in every place in the world just about, but not to all the people because the gospel still has to go some places. You need to get the word out. So we're part of an enterprise that is larger than the First Baptist Church here in this town. We have other churches here. And I always like it when we have the uh, Holy Week and we go to different churches and fellowship and we're reminded that what we have in common is more important and it brings us together what we have in Jesus. What we have in Jesus. So the church is growing. That's the kingdom of God. The church is spread abroad. We're going to be teaching all things. So today, you can go to different places and, and worship. And maybe things are a little different. I've been to churches outside the United States, been to see people. It's just wonderful when you get together. I can remember going down to Dominican Republic and going down there to do some mission work. And a, some, there were some college students came over to the missionary's house because he was there at the college teaching them how to fly airplanes of all things, but he had led them to Christ and they were going out into the villages and sharing the gospel. I sat down and talked with one of them. He didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Spanish, but we knew what we were talking about. Because he loved Jesus, and I loved him too. And that bond just comes together no matter where you are. That's the love that Christ puts in our hearts, a love that wants to include. But we're, we're part of a great enterprise called the church. But this is the best part. Not only are we the church or the called out, not only are we a, a church of an assembly or the church that is the body of Christ. We're part of the church spread abroad. Praise be to God. We're part of the church triumphant. The church cannot burn. The church will never burn. And the devil and the world and everything in it can never destroy God's church because it's built on a solid foundation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. No greater foundation can be laid than Jesus himself. Amen. So do not be afraid. Oh, they've tried through the years to destroy the church. But the church is triumphant. Isn't it wonderful? It's wonderful to be on a, a winning team, guys, isn't it? It's wonderful to have all these kids here in Rockmark doing a great job. But I tell you, we can think about this. The greatest winning team is the church, the body of Christ. It's a church triumphant. I remember the, this passage, you heard it before, the Thessalonians. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven and shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord. It's important this church triumphant. We'll be church. Those who've gone on before will be united with the ones who remain. The church is eternal. It has no end. It has a beginning, but it has no end. And then that passage of scripture that's, that gives you a, it, just, it, it makes me kind of, I don't know, just, I guess, tingle a little bit when I think about it. 
Then came one of the seven angels out of the book of Revelation, who had seven bowls full of seven last plagues, spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb, the bride of Christ. Now the sense of the new Jerusalem be like a bride adorned coming down, but adorned for a wedding. That's true. But I tell you, on that day when we shall rise again, when Christ returns and we are joined with the church of the ages, that church, the bride of Christ, will be adorned greater than Jerusalem ever will. That's God's plan. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, have you been washed in the precious blood of Jesus? This is your future. This is your hope. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I'm looking forward to it. I, I always love my pastor, Brother Jason. He always wants to end up with talking about he's coming. He's coming. He's coming soon. Has there been a time in your life where Jesus came to you and spoke to you? said, come unto me. And you think, well, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. I remember I was nine years old and somebody, the pastor gave an invitation. I went down front. And they had an inquiry room, which is really smart when you're dealing with children. So I went in and the pastor talked to me. He said, now, he said, now, Billy, you, you know that you've accepted Christ. I've done what? That scared me so bad, I got up out of that chair and I ran home six blocks. <laughs> I wasn't ready. And Tim, I had a Sunday school teacher, a blue-collar worker, who taught me about Jesus. One day he said to me, it was in a revival on Easter Sunday morning, I remember came to me, he was sitting there, and my, my, my friend Larry went down, and we were buddies, and, but I'm not going down there for cause of Larry, I'm not going down there because of him, I'm, I tried that one time, it didn't work, <laughs> and my Sunday school teacher looked at me, and he said, Billy, don't you think today's the day, I said, yes, sir, at, at church, I could seat 300, and I remember walking down the aisle, and I got about the second pew from the front there, and I said, wait a minute. I'm not going because he said, and I'm not coming down here because Larry said, this step I take of faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was saved, and my life was changed that day. It was changed that day. My mother said I came home a different person. You see, you've got to take that step of faith. It only takes one. It wasn't the 25 I took to the front. It was that one step. I'm, coming, I'm throwing in all. I'm, letting, I'm holding back nothing, no ifs, ands, or but. I'm putting it all on the line for you. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, come and follow me, take up your cross. Put your life on the line. Put it in my hands. And you'll never regret it. And praise God to this day. I've served him since I was 13 years old. And I'm, I'm sort of like the happy goodmans. I wouldn't take nothing from a journey now. Nothing. Nothing. 